speak about tunnel construction and walk through the key aspects there. So I'll turn it back over to John. Thank you, Mike. Um, so in terms of tunnel construction, I'll, I'll start off with a general uh, description of the overall construction approach. So um, the, the sequence starts on the on the Mackinac station shaft uh, and portal on the south side. Uh, that's the, that 400 foot long slot that we talked about earlier. And that slot will partially be formed with permanent reinforced concrete uh, diaphragm walls. And the southern temporary section that gets backfilled later is supported with rock bolts and mesh. Once that's been excavated, the TBM will be put, brought to the site in pieces and assembled uh, down in, in that shaft. Um, this will include the shield and the carter head and most of the backup grant trees. I think uh, the TBM will be about 500 foot long when fully assembled. But for launching the TBM, we can make do with a slightly shorter sequence of around 400 feet. So once that's assembled and connected into a new electrical substation from the, the nearby power supply, uh, the TBM will be launched to start its journey under the straits. And as we briefly discussed before, the TBM advances in a series of steps. Uh, so each step involves the TBM advancing. If you look at the lower image here, you see um, a series of hydraulic um, cylinders in the center of the image, and they push the, the shield and cutter head off the completed tunnel lining to move the TBM forwards. And so you, they, they push forward six feet at a time, and then the segments are assembled um, in that six foot gap and we basically do this three and a half thousand times and we get across the straits plus as we've already discussed stops for maintenance and uh, and other reasons yeah and this is a quick i, I think we saw a similar animation earlier but you can see the segments being installed and then as the as the tbm pushes forward the yellow cylinders in this case are pushing the machine forwards and there's a small void outside of the lining between the lining where the shield was and that's filled with with cement grout as the machine advances so you're simultaneously um, filling any space as it's created so this is just a, an illustration of how the pressurized aspect of the machine works so outside you have of the the TBM, the submarine, you have the water pressure predominantly, and maybe sort of also some some pressure from loosened rock sections. And the, the cutter head chamber in the front of the TBM is, is filled with a bentonite slurry, and the pressure is set to, to balance the external water pressure. Uh, and it acts as a sealing membrane across the tunnel face and uh, provides that balance. So the, the shield itself, so to the right of right hand side of this image, that provides for the safety of personnel, uh, the TBM and the tunnel. So the shield prevents any water or rock from entering the tunnel during construction. So there's never any rock exposed during this operation. You, ha you have the shield around you and then the tunnel lining is built inside the shield and there's um, some seals between the tunnel lining uh, and the TBM steel shield. So it's a fully enclosed system. So that, that avoids the potential for any cave-ins. During the tunneling process, there's a lot of instrumentation and monitoring, uh, recording uh, of data points thousands of times a second. Um, so every, everything is instrumented and closely monitored to make sure that every, the TBM is performing as anticipated. One advantage of a slurry machine over some of the other types of machine is that uh, the slurry pressure can be very carefully controlled. Um, the, the range is 0.3 over bar, so that's uh, a very small limit compared with the pressures we're talking about. And this means we can avoid overpressurizing the slurry, which uh, could cause it to escape in fissures into the rock. So we 
we have the pressure set at the right level uh, that's programmed into the TBM and it's there's fail safe devices against overpressurization. Moving on to the talk about the slurry uh, treatment plant or the separation plant as it's known. So this is outside of the tunnel on the surface at the Mackinac um, station portal site at the south side. And this is, is like a small factory that comes in, in containers and is, is assembled on site and it serves to treat the slurry. So on the TBM, as the rock is excavated and, and broken into small fragments, those fragments enter the slurry system as a, as a suspension. So you have the bentonite slurry plus chips of rock. And that comes out through the green line here. And so you can see it comes out of the tunnel. It's pump, pumped in a, in a system. And that goes into the first stage separation plant. Uh, in this um, plant, the, the chunks of rock, the chippings are, are screened out. It's a bit like a sieve that the, the um, or a series of sieves or screens that the slurry is passed through and it will take out any elements of, of the rock and allow the slurry to continue. And that then goes into these, these slurry tanks. You'll see there's four of them and that, that's really just used to balance different batches and make sure the densities and consistency is maintained. Um, and from those tanks, the clean bentonite is pumped back into the tunnel. And the solid materials that come out of the separation plant are um, then piled up and loaded onto trucks and removed from site. Um, sometimes the slurry needs additional cleaning. Uh, this is when you get very fine materials, so maybe some clay or silt particles um, into the mix. Um, that won't come out in the in the sieve screens, and in this case we go through a, a separation plant. Um, it goes through a series of what we call filter presses, which you can maybe stretching this a little bit, but you can think of like a coffee filter. Um, doesn't let any of the grains get through, but the liquid goes through. Um, so that cleans uh, cleans further, and again you get some solid materials coming off that, which is trucked off site. Finally, if there is any excess water in the system, that goes through the water treatment plant. Um, now we, we will reuse and recycle the water to the greatest possible extent. So the vast majority of water is, is still contained within the system and used for construction. Um, if, but if there is excess water that we want to get rid of, it goes through this water treatment plant. There's a whole range of, of treatment in line with all the permitting and regulatory requirements. Um, and it's tested before any discharge in, into the lake. Just covering a number of other construction activities on the next slide. Um, so interventions we, we've talked about, um, these will either be free air, or hydrostatic pressures. Um, and as mentioned before, the contractor has to develop his work plans, including how he deals with any water inflows um, and you know the, the safety and the logistics of getting people in. If we need to do the hyperbaric interventions, uh, we would use, or the contractor would use specialist labor um, who are used to working under elevated pressures. Typically, there, there would be divers that are trained in this work. Uh, they enter the TBM through an airlock, and then the pressure is increased until the working pressure is reached, at which point they can go into the cutter head and do their maintenance. The cutter head is, in that case, partially filled with, with air under pressure so they can access the equipment. And then afterwards, they would go through decompression. It's a similar process that the deep sea divers would go through. On, on tunnel projects, because especially at ones at, at higher pressures, because of the durations of the decompression needed for safety, um, the labor may live in a pressurized habitat. And you can see that in this image here. It's, it's like a capsule. Um, 
from the surface and it's brought down into the tunnel and connects into the TBM at pressure. And this avoids them having to do the compression and decompression on the TBM, which would mean the TBM is stopped for quite a period of time. Um, they can live in their pressurized habitat on the surface for a, a shift of several weeks or, or, or so and to come down to the TBM to do the maintenance. I talked a little bit about the temporary water treatment plants um, in addition to the the slurry treatment plant, this, these need to handle um, stormwater and any flows into the portals or any groundwater inflows. Um, the treatment plants will treat all the water used and encountered during the tunnel shaft and portal excavations. The treatment levels and discharge criteria must be in accordance with the specifications. We've outlined those in detail. Uh, and they also apply, um, conform with the applicable um, NIPTIS or the National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permits for the project uh, before um, being discharged. As mentioned before, we don't expect this particular geology to have hazardous gases. However, um, in the spirit of, of risk mitigation and, and in compliance with the various OSHA regulations, um, we will provide tunnel ventilation throughout the tunneling process, as well as gas detection and monitoring equipment on the TBM and th throughout the tunnel. Um, so the gas detection system monitors for a range of different gases and also for oxygen uh, lack if the oxygen level drops below the 20% level um, and this is this is tied in with the, the TBM control systems if there are concentrations exceeding certain limits detected then the monitoring system will activate alarms it will adjust the, the flow in the ventilation system to provide uh, more fresh air and will shut down any non-essential uh, electrical power systems, depending on, on the particular alarm. Just finally, a word about the disposal of excavated materials. Um, so the materials will after coming through the um, the separation plant, will be non-hazardous, and um, Enbridge has identified five potential disposal sites already, um, including two potential sites on the north side and three on the south side. Uh, these sites are uh, active quarries or sand and gravel mining operations, so they have excavated voids that are ready to be filled. Um, we won't need to create any new ground disturbance to, for them to be able to accept the excavated material. And they have obtained the necessary environmental permits for the material uh, to be disposed there. Um, the material would be transported along existing public roads um, and won't require any new road construction outside of the project sites. And Enbridge is committed to using upland areas, sorry, not wetland areas that don't contain any federal or state protected species or any significant cultural resources for um, disposal of excavated material. So I think that's the end of this section. If there's any questions, I'd be happy to take them. Uh, on the disposal, uh do the trucks have to go through a town setting, a, a populated area to get to these disposal sites? John, the, the question was, the routes that have been picked for where these five potential disposal sites are, three on one side of the bridge and two on the other, do they, are they going through populated areas, towns and communities and such? I'm yeah, I'm... I might throw that question to Lisa. Outside actually. of my remit, yeah, yeah. So I might actually. I'm, 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 I'm going to throw that question to Lisa. Maps um, yeah. and um, 
No, they do not pass through towns. And I, I think it's also important to note that the reason that there are locations on the north is that there will be excavated materials from the shaft on the north side. Yeah. Um, so there's no intent of transporting the excavated materials across the Mackinac Bridge. Okay. Also, uh, I'm just curious, what, what kind of guidance do you use to guide to, on that tunnel to make sure you come out the right place? How do you make, how, what, what guidance systems does a TVM have to make sure it's going and aligning in the right, the, exactly the right precise alignments? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Um, so the, um, the there's um, established survey techniques for these tunnels, and so typically um, even tunnels much longer than this will hit their target within an inch of um, precision at the far end. Um, the way the TBM itself steers is the, the surveyors will set up a, a laser beam in the tunnel, mm -hmm. and they they know the alignment of that laser beam, both in, in plan and, and profile. And the TBM um, has a guidance system that, that takes information from that, um, and, and, it, and that's used for steering the, the TBM. Okay. And there's various survey techniques to get the survey control down into the tunnel, obviously. It's a long, narrow pipe, so it's um, a bit more challenging than being in the open, but it's um, established procedures. Great, thank you. John, did you say that the water discharge from construction activities will actually be subject to an NPDES permit, and has that been an applied and uh, applied for and granted? Um, I'm going to throw that question to Lisa. Lisa, the question is on the NIPDES permit. Uh, yes, yeah, yes, there is a NIPDES permit that has been issued. Um, and it reflects not only the discharge from the um, slurry treatment plant, but also the, uh, the discharge during free air interventions, which actually governs the um, <clears throat> largest magnitude of, uh, largest volume of water that would be released. And that water is, uh, as I think we mentioned when we were talking about groundwater chemistry, very similar to the lake water, but would be subject to the, the same NIPTES requirements. Mr. Nystrom, any questions from you? John, the, uh, the TBM is obviously a very sophisticated piece of equipment. What is the, I mean, you, they, they aren't just sitting in contractors' yards someplace. Um, uh, what is the lead time on something like that, and where does it come from? Yeah, it's um, somewhere typically between 12 to 18 months um, from the point of ordering the TBM to it being on, on site. That there are just uh, a few manufacturers around the world. Um, and what, um, what has happened on the project, though, is some pre-design has been done um, before the order's been placed so that um, some of that preparation has, has already happened. That will save a, a couple of months on the, on the schedule. Um. All right. Uh, we're Aaron Dennis. We're going to move on to operations now, and Aaron's going to walk us through uh, the, the pipeline in the tunnel and what those facilities look like. So Aaron, over to you. Sure. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, yes, so just to, to recap, um, my name is Aaron Dennis. I'm with Enbridge, um, and I'm the engineer lead uh, overseeing the design from our perspective. So I'll take you through today um, an overview of the operations and give you a better sense of uh, what each site looks like on each end of the uh, the tunnel and um, kind of what goes inside. So, if, Amber, if we go to the next slide, we'll, we'll get started. So, um, earlier, I think each speaker uh, spoke a little bit about the ends of the tunnel. Um, so, we're going to go through Mackinac first. So, this is the south side of the, of the project. And on the screen, um, outlined in red is actually the existing Mackinac pump station. So, to give you some lay of land, um, headlands, uh, 
drive runs north south on the right hand side and the Conquin drive runs east west just north of the pump station so um on on the image so the yellow building over to the left would uh, be the permanent uh, uh building uh, that would sit over top of the portal that uh, john discussed earlier and the green uh extending northward so up the pages north um heads out towards the straits so that would be the underground tunnel and basically where it clips off on the, on the top side is where you reach um, the water so the red solid line or so the uh, blue solid line uh, in the image would be the new uh, proposed 30 inch pipeline that would connect over from the building um, to the existing facility and then the blue dash line is the existing 20 inch pipeline the, the west pipeline uh, comes on land there so a couple things um, while we're looking at this image and the the building itself um, it sits over top of this this shaft um, and what's inside of it so it, the pipeline um, needs to get from the tunnel elevation up to the grade elevation so this building and and shaft that sits over top of allows for that so it's that space where it can can rise up and and, and meet above grade it also houses the vertical risers for the other systems so we've got mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and ventilation systems that are required for tunnel operation. Um, so we'll get into those systems in a little bit, but that's kind of what all fits inside. Um, access into the tunnel um, is, is, would be through the tunnel building, uh, down either an elevator or a vehicle lift. Um, there's mention of a tunnel service vehicle, which we'll talk about in a minute, but that vehicle would be lowered down to tunnel elevation. And then uh, it would provide access into that tunnel. Um, that whole facility, as, as you'd expect, would be a secured facility, card access, and, and, and uh, secured. So, the image on the screen um, is is a cross section of this uh, facility. So it's Mackinac Station section view. So you can see the modeled in silver is the 30-inch pipeline um, extending from the tunnel elevation up through the building, uh, which is the vertical riser, and then out at the side where it traverses above grade on a set of above ground supports, expansion loop, and then transitions below grade where it runs over to the existing facility. You can also see in blue, this is the uh, ventilation duct, which we'll talk about the ventilation system in a minute, uh, but it also, you can see it just it really provides a, a pathway for these systems to reach from that subsurface tunnel elevation up through to grade. So this would be, um, I think John mentioned earlier, it's about 100 feet by 50 feet uh, rectangular box in the finished condition. Construction is much longer, 400 feet long. So that's Mackinac, and we're just going to jump up to the North Straits. So um, similar um, building, in fact, on the North Straits, so showing a yellow there. Um, the existing uh, facility, North Straits facility, is outlined in red. Um, and this facility, the new building, sits actually between the pipelines. So on the um, plan views shown earlier, um, we do cross uh, over the pipeline um, on the south side of the project and end up in between. So the new facility is, is here. The uh, green is the tunnel, of course, coming into the, the, the shaft and the building sits over top. And then new 30-inch uh, pipeline shown in blue would then connect over to the existing facility, uh, the existing pipelines dash blue shown there as well. Just like the south side, this facility um, is, would be secured, uh, fenced, and access controlled. Um, and the subsurface levels of each of these buildings um, are, are secure and uh, will be treated as a, as a permit confined space, so restricted access. So here we have a section view as well, showing um, a little bit similar layout. Uh, this is, of course, a round shaft as described um, by John. But we've got the pipeline shown in, in silver, rising tunnel elevation up through these subsurface levels, up and up the building, and then ductwork and uh, access routes for existing, uh, or sorry, for tunnel systems. On the north side, um, has a stairwell um, and also access for uh, uh, an elevator should we choose to uh, install one. All right. So next thing to speak a little bit about space proofing. So. This is a, a very um, important part of the project. So we did end up with a 21 foot internal diameter uh, tunnel, which may sound large to begin with, um, but as, as John uh, mentioned earlier, you know, we, you, you start building it out, you're looking at the space required for the pipeline. So the image on the left shows that cross section of the pipeline, and then you, we need space to 
inspect and maintain that pipeline. So you end up with this um, clearance zone around that pipe. And then you end up with, you know, how do you get into the tunnel? So we have uh, come up with a, a custom designed tunnel service vehicle shown on the right. It's a uh, bi-directional service vehicle that would provide access and equipment into the tunnel. So we need to provide pathway for that. So there's a clearance zone in the middle. And then you've got uh, space allocated for future third party utilities. So the box in the cross section, the yellow uh, in the upper right hand corner. And then you've got some of the other services in the systems. So we'll low point uh, where this cross section is taken. We've got some decking over top of our sump that would collect the infiltrated water. That's at 7,000 gallons per day. And then we have a sump system. So we have uh, pumps and piping necessary to take that water from the sump and bring it back up to surface, which we'll talk about in a minute. So it's been very important to preserve the real estate inside this tunnel uh, as much as practical and, and save space for future. So a lot of thoughts gone into in how you how you can do that. So the pipeline itself um, sits on precast concrete pipe supports, with contoured rollers, um, with 30 inch clearance around that pipeline, and um, <clears throat> the uh, sorry yes, um, and then yes, yeah, so power of comms as I mentioned have been phase space proof for the in the uh, upper right quadrant. Um, just to note on the vehicle while we're there, it, it is bi-directional. And there's no place to turn around inside the tunnel. So it might look peculiar to have a dual cab, but it allows workers um, two on one side, two on the other, to traverse into the tunnel um, and do their work and then return uh, back to the south side. So we'll move on to ventilation system. So we're talking about each of the systems here. So the system is comprised of two fan plant buildings one on each, uh, the top of each of the tunnel uh, access shafts, and they're connected together by the, by the tunnel itself. So the ventilation duct, supply duct, extends downwards through the access shafts that were shown in the cross sections earlier, and passed through the airlock doors. The doors allow for the tunnel to be ventilated without the need for ducting along the entire length of the tunnel, and secondly, shuts in the tunnel to limit the supply of oxygen in an extremely rare event of a fire. Um, Emergency power generators are provided to supply the, the fan in the event of a power or utility outage. And uh, the, supply, the, the ventilation system supplies necessary um, breathing air for any, any uh, inner workers uh, entering the tunnel. So the system itself operates in uh, two ways. So first one being normal operating conditions. So during that time, um, the, the tunnel ventilation system is turned off the airlock doors are closed, and the systems operating within the tunnel are, are the electrical communications and hydrocarbon and gas detection systems and the tunnel sump. So all the tunnel supporting systems inside, but the ventilation systems off. During times of uh, tunnel entry and, and doing perform maintenance, that tunnel system the ventilation would be turned on to provide that, that airflow and that exchange that people can go in and do their work under free air. So you wouldn't require a breathing apparatus to do those activities. So talking a little bit further about uh, the, the leaking gas detection system. So it's comprised of two layers. So the first layer is the computational pipeline monitoring system, where the Ambridge Control Center can constantly monitors pressure, temperature, flow, and other key data to identify and respond to unexpected changes uh, quickly. Um, the second layer is an external leak detection system installed within the tunnel. It is comprised of gas monitors and liquid hydrocarbon detections, uh, as you would find on typically at any confined space to further mitigate, mitigate the risk of fire. There's detectors. These detectors will be installed at key locations uh, along the tunnel's length and at uh, locations um, near the tunnel entrances. Um, they're installed in the these detectors are also installed in these shafts of so Mackinac North Street uh, shaft sumps themselves and the tunnel sump. And these devices communicate directly back to that Enbridge Control Center where they're monitored 24 7, 365 by a dedicated team. In addition, um, all the equipment inside the tunnel, including that service vehicle, uh, will comply and, and are designed to comply with Class 1 Division 2 location, which means they can safely operate in a hazardous atmosphere. Um, some of the other uh, systems you, you'd find in here. So we have uh, electrical systems to support, um, you know, the pumps and, and um, communications. 
and the communication system would be comprised of a uh, radio communication back to surface, so leaky feeder cable, uh, so two-way communication for the workers to control back to communicate back to a control room on each end of the tunnel, and then spaced uh, distributed along the tunnel length, approximately every 800 feet, we have dedicated hard line um, called mine phones, and they're you'd walk along, be able to walk along, pick up the phone, and it would connect you direct to the control center. So we have multiple means of communication underground. The tunnel sump system, so we've got a cross section on the screen, um, so we can see some green piping and pumps on the right hand side. Um, this is the tunnel sump uh, to T section and the water would accumulate it below. This, this water would, would collect here um, as from infiltrated water, as John was describing, and it'll <clears throat> it also collect condensation um, during times of tunnel entry where we're doing work in the tunnel and ventilating that. The tunnel remains quite cool throughout the year, and then as you're, you know, picture a hot summer day and a, a cool glass of water, you've got condensation forming on the outside of that. If you're inside the tunnel on a, a warm summer uh, day in Michigan, you know, 80 Fahrenheit air going through the tunnel, you'd end up with some condensation. So that water would also collect at this low point location and be pumped back up. So the pumps system is comprised of two pumps. Um, each pump is independently controlled through a control system, and each have independent power supplies to prevent a power failure from stopping the pump discharge. So all the tunnel water inflow will pump through this, this location back up to the Mackinac side, so everything heads south of the tunnel up through that riser that we saw earlier, and to an oil water separator at Mackinac Station before it would be discharged to an outfall at the Straits. The sump pump operates uh, intermittently, so given the, the rates we're uh, expecting performance requirements of the tunnel, we're expecting it to turn on uh, approximately once every six days to remove the water that's accumulated in the tunnel. Um, showing also on the image here, um, although reflective, there would actually be steel grating, um, is the is removable panel, so you can actually get in and clean the sump out for maintenance purposes. And should the ever unlikely event of a leak uh, occur, you could go in and uh, and remove root product. That was the case. So next slide, here we are. So um, on the left hand side, we can actually see uh, the airlock doors just in the distance there. So there's two bollards that sit upright, and in, the, in between that, there's airlock doors that have been entered into the tunnel. Pipeline and ventilation duct are also shown there. And so let's just talk a little bit about what it would be like going into the tunnel. So as I mentioned earlier, tunnel entry is limited and would be treated as a permit confined space at, as for average operating practices. So we try to restrict entry to as much as practical. So um, frequency of entry would be perhaps once per month to do any sort of maintenance or inspection within that tunnel. So in order to do that, the ventilation system uh, would be turned on to allow access. So entry would take place um, for the Mackinac station side. So the team would assemble, you conduct a pre-job um, uh, review and, and meeting to talk about the plans and how you're gonna go in and what equipment you need and make sure you're, you're prepped and ready to go. While you'd be doing that, the fans will be running and circulating air and purging that, that, uh, the tunnel of that, uh, the air as it's, you know, sits closed for, for that month. And then you would load your tunnel service vehicle up with any equipment you'd need. You would uh, uh, lower it down to the tunnel uh, subsurface elevation, and then the workers would then uh, take the elevator down to, to meet the, the, uh, the vehicle there, board it, and go in to do their activity. So they would drive in through, past the bullards, airlock doors would open, then you could get access to the tunnel. And during that time, you'd be in constant communication with the uh, the team on the surface. So there'd be staff both in north and south side while you have a team working inside. And uh, you'd conduct your work and then return back the same way you came. So what would you be doing inside the tunnel? Well, there's various inspections that we'd, we'd be performing. So uh, we'd be performing pipeline coating and pipe support inspections on a periodic basis. We'd have... There's a tunnel um, inspection program that's to be implemented uh, and include a rigorous periodic inspection uh, program for the tunnel itself. And really it's to make sure the tunnel is performing as anticipated, similar to how you, you'd inspect bridges and transportation tunnels. 
Um, so those protocols uh, are to be developed and implemented as part of this project and, uh, and to ensure ongoing operability and integrity of the structure. Other types of maintenance. Um, so the, again, pipeline and pipe support will be routinely inspected and, and maintained as required. Um, the tunnel and tunnel systems, uh, which can include the sump pumps, um, cable trays, electrical equipment, um, but also inspection of the tunnel liner, the gaskets, uh, any of those control systems, leak and hydrocarbon detection systems, um, and, and, and comms. So all those sorts of systems we'd be going in and, 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 um, and making sure running as they, as they should. Um, the, the, finally, there's the, uh, the ventilation system and inspection um, that would be done, be able to be done from the surface, but also we'd be going and inspect uh, primarily the airlocks where, where that ductwork extends through. So that's just a, a bit of an overview um, of the systems, uh, give you an idea of what that's like and, and what it could be like to go in, and then certainly have to take any questions if there are any. Question? Mr. England. Yes. Uh, what is the propulsion on that vehicle? Is that electric or? Um, the tunnel service vehicle? Yes. Propulsion? Yes, it's, it would be an electric vehicle. Okay. Uh, just a way out question if you know in an extreme storm situation where there's an emergency of getting somebody down to a hospital could that tunnel be used as an uh for that kind of transport mr england i might i'm not sure aaron was the right person to answer that question uh, you know as you said well, most, to, yeah. mostly i mean yeah. it's a policy question i understand yeah. and so yeah. he really can't answer that but is there a physical reason that you couldn't do that is there a um, yeah aaron go ahead well just, just i mean uh talk about space proofing i guess so i had a, a section up there earlier showing the envelope we have for for the tunnel service people to transit the tunnel so yeah. That's what it's designed for. It's a it's a secure space where you want to, um, you know, we, we've limited access uh, to certain types of equipment, class one, dip two. So um, that is the intent. Uh, the intent is not to spend, uh, you know, limit time inside the tunnel being a confined space. No, right. But you could, in an extreme emergency, use that electric vehicle to enter at one side and get out at the other side. You, yes, I mean, it's just, as like I said, it's a secure space, but you, yes, absolutely, someone could traverse the tunnel uh, from south to north. Um, there's no vehicle left on the north side, so you would end up parking your vehicle and then um, uh, getting back to grade either by, well, by stairs. Okay, thank you. Um, I'm, I'm wondering about the extraction of 7,000 gallons of water on a consistent basis during operations. Is that something that would be required even after the, uh, the tunnel has been decommissioned? Um, or would you envision the, the tunnel at that point just filling up with water? And, and what are the consequences of that? Mr. Um, yeah. So maybe I'll speak to the Aaron, first half of that and I'll maybe you. ask John to answer the second half. But okay. <laughs> um, yeah, so, so the system's designed to manage that infiltration rate and that's a performance requirement based on, you know, day one of operations, right? So um, so that would be expected throughout the, the lifespan of the, of the tunnel. So those 99 years, we'd expect a similar flow to that that we've been managing. Um, what happens after that, and I guess what happens ultimately to the, to the tunnel, um, I, I mean, if, if it were to want to be flooded, I guess that's something that obviously the state of Michigan would want to be, um, be yeah, I guess their, their decision being the, the ultimate owner of the tunnel, but it would obviously yeah, there would be some discussion there required. I don't know, Amber, do you want to take a swag yeah, in answering that yeah. question, or should we get John to answer yeah, about no, a tunnel no. situation? Actually, Aaron, you answered it exactly as I would, because as I interpreted the question, the question was, at some point in the future, if we decided we didn't want to use the tunnel anymore, I think at that point, that would have to be a discussion with a board like this, the cor corridor authority, with the ultimate owners of the tunnel, we'd have to dig in and understand what, how that, you know, what that would look like and why we would want to do that. John Hurt, did you want to comment on the possibility of um, 
leaving the tunnel, just allowing it to fill with water? Um, yeah, I guess in, in the technical performance of the tunnel, that would, wouldn't be a problem. It's just, we use this system for water supply tunnels, so they have, you know, the segments would be fine with water on the inside. Um, so that, that's feasible. I'm, I'm asking it really in, in the broader context. I mean, in a regulatory context, frequently when you're addressing things like nuclear plant decommissioning or um, underground mining operations where the mine is no longer utilized but has to, in essence, be decommissioned. Um, I, I've seen those types of issues confronted. This is, in that context, a much smaller operation than either of those, but I'm, I'm just wondering from the vantage point of having to, at some point in the future, no longer contemplate that this tunnel would be operational, whether there are any environmental consequences to uh, to simply having it either fill up with water or if there are some other steps that would be necessary to decommission its operation in a, in a responsible manner. Mm -hmm. that, that might be more than what you signed up to present this morning, but it's something that I want the company to contemplate and have an answer for it at some point. Fair point. One noted. Noted. Any more questions on operations? No? All right. Then with that, we'll move on to our final section. I think we're doing pretty well with time. It's just essentially on the RFP process and what the next steps might be. Um, I will also note, Mr. Nystrom, when you were asked the question, I was surprised John didn't say it, but perhaps he wasn't comfortable, but I did want to circle back on the tunnel boring machine question um, because it is, it is quite interesting. And as you pointed out, I think intuitively you almost think of a machine like that as being kind of rough and tumble when in fact it's very sophisticated as we've noted and discussed. Right now, our preferred manufacturer for that TBM would be is in Germany. And so that tunnel, that, that, like uh, John noted, there's a handful of companies around the world that would have the experience and the ability to build a TBM, the slurry TBM, that we spec'd out. And uh, the, the vendor that we've got our eye on, of course, this is a decision that is also is with the contractor, um, is, in, is in fact in Germany. And what was interesting for me as well is we did actually engage that TBM manufacturer in some of our discussions already. As John said, some plans have been laid and work has taken place already to start thinking about what the design of that TBM would look like. And we leveraged that manufacturer in Germany as well for those plans. Thank you. Yeah, one of the best in the world, in fact. Probably the best. Yeah. All right, RFP <coughs> process. Not quite as exciting as all the technical detail, but still very important. So I'm going to walk you guys through this. So as Mike Mooney pointed out in the very beginning when we started today, he talked about the model. The model CMGC is what it's called. Don't get lost in the acronyms. They don't make that much sense anyways. At the end of the day, what it meant is from day one, we were going to onboard a construction company, and in this case it was two, JD and Obiashi, to provide input in the design right from day one. I like to think of it as kind of adding the street smart. You know how you'd say somebody is really book smart, but they don't have the street smart? I like saying that constructability was like adding that in. Those are the guys with the dirt on the boots, with the real experience, and their input was invaluable. So that was the model. That was the plan we submitted to the corridor authority as well, was we were going to use the CMGC process. So then in January of 2019, we actually awarded two contracts. So we selected ERA to be our engineer of record as the lead designers, and then we um, hired the Great Lakes Tunnel constructors as well, JD and Obiashi, to provide us with that constructability input. We received that input and we completed the design. The part of, the, part of the, uh, the notion with this model as well is that it does enable you to once you get the design, you can go back out to market. That is obviously what Enbridge is going to do. We will now take that design and we'll be putting it back out to market. Um, that is 
how that CMGC model is built. Um, so earlier this year, we also did issue out to the market expressions of interest, so we could we could in, we could vet and get a short list of contractors who in the future might be interested. Not only that they're interested though, but they meet a minimum criteria. We have an expectation of what the skill set that the contractor will need to have to build this project. So we use that process as well to identify that short list. Um, the RFP package itself uh, is essentially comprised of two sections, a commercial section and a technical section. So that commercial section, this is where the contractor is going to tell us about their, capa their capacity, their capability, uh, their, pr their price proposal, so how much, uh, what they're estimating the project to cost, as well as their cost and schedule control. So that's all articulated in the commercial section of the RFP response that the contractors will be expected to provide. The other section is technical. Now this is where they're going to lay out for us their plan, their approach to tunnel construction. What is their plan for interventions? What is, how are they going to install the pipeline? How are they, what's their process for addressing risk management? Uh, quality management, safety. We want to see what their schedule is. We, this also includes, and probably one of the most important aspects of the technical um, component is their key personnel. We, they have to identify their actual team. So this isn't a company. We want to see the actual people. Who is the human being that will be the project manager? Who is the person that is going to be accountable for the progress of the TBM? So th that's an important section. Um, and it's always um, very interesting to understand who they're proposing to do the job. So some of the key documents that the contractor will get, uh, just so everybody can understand a little bit about um, an RFP process, we obviously give them instructions how they're meant to respond, a project description, the permit conditions we have obtained uh, by the time, you know, we've obtained, like, for example, the Eagle permits. The contractor needs to know what those are because they must comply. We'll have specifications, the joint specifications, as well as other specifications, construction drawings, geotechnical reports. So that's, it's, quite a, it's quite a robust package of information. Um, the next step in that process as we're keen to obtain the authority and the board's concurrence, and I believe that is scheduled to happen at a meeting in October. And uh, that is where we're at in the RFP process, and I would be pleased if you had any follow-up questions on that. No questions? We're, um, you mentioned two contractors, Obayashi and JD, that were involved in consultation on the specifications that will be developed in the RFP package. Are either of those contractors also entities that identified themselves in the expressions of interest um, that you've solicited? Yes, I believe one of them did also express interest moving forward. They partnered with another constructor company though. Anything else, Paul? No. <coughs> I'd, um, I guess I'm going to just make a statement on this RFP uh, process. I know it's very sensitive for Enbridge. Um, as we move forward as a public body, we are uh, scrutinized and put under pressure to disclose as much information as possible. And yet understanding the sensitivity of, of a project like this and, and information that uh, you all have to work with with your contractors ultimately, um, we need to move forward though in a way that uh, we as a public body, the public at large, um, does have access to the information. We are going to be um, in a position of, of approving components of the RFP and ultimately approving the RFP at our meeting in October. Um, and in doing so, uh, we have to have access to that information. And, and so we need to find a way forward together on how we do that. Um, and, and I think that uh, we need to work hard with, uh, in doing that. I know our Attorney General representative, uh, Ray Howd, has been uh, working with your legal counsel, but uh, just understanding the, the sensitivity for us as board members 
uh, to move that forward in a way that uh, is transparent. I think that's important. I, Mr. Nystrom, I agree with you 100%, and I believe with the representatives you've assigned that have worked with us on a kind of a, a regular, at, at that ground level on a regular day, I do believe we've come up with something that I think everybody, all parties will be satisfied with. Fantastic, thank you. Yeah. So with that, I think we've come to an end then, Amber? We're I believe we've yeah. got, Mike Mooney, did you have anything else you wanted to add? Mike may not still be able to hear us from his end. Uh, no, but nothing left to really add. I, I would just come back to Member Novak's question about decommissioning, if I could for a minute. And, and just to put in context, I assume that Member Novak, you meant tunnel decommissioning at the end of the service life or at the end of the lease agreement. So as you, I'm sure, are aware, but just for the broader information, the, the tunnel agreement has provision for um, the development of a robust decommissioning plan that must be in place before a lease agreement is entered into with Enbridge. So time frame wise, if we think about the time it takes to move from where we are today to completion of the tunnel, which let's just say for the sake of mental um, argument here is on the order of five years, then during that the next five years where the lease agreement is developed uh, between the authority and Enbridge, the decommissioning plan would be put in place during that period, needs to be robust for sure and would be part of a lease agreement. The authority has to approve the decommissioning plan. Decommissioning is entirely paid for uh, by Enbridge per the tunnel agreement. Um, and you could envision aspects where all of the pipeline is, for example, from an environmental sustainability perspective, all of the pipeline is removed. For example, again, this would be developed during the development of the plan. All of the pipeline would be removed, completely clean tunnel. Then in terms of just how do you deal with the tunnel sort of beyond its service life, oftentimes infrastructure, particularly underground, remains in excellent condition and could have a uh, different purpose. It's really difficult for all of us to contemplate what might a use be 99 years from now or even 50 years from now, just given the changing landscape of, of needs. But there certainly could be that option. That's up to authority as the owner of the tunnel. But if it were determined to decommission, then there are definitely environmentally sustainable options to, to decommission. Mike Mooney, thank you for raising that. I feel like I was remiss in not pointing out that that decommissioning is part of our one of our deliverables, that decommissioning plan. So I'm, I'm glad that you raised that part of the deliverables. Yeah, and I, I was interested in it just from a long-term environmental sustainability perspective. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm sure there are alternative applications that could be envisioned for that space, even if it were no longer used to transport um, petroleum products. Um, but, but what I was concerned about, and, and I don't know, it, it may be relatively minor. I, I've, I've listed the two instances where I've confronted those kinds of issues before. One is in decommissioned nuclear plants, and one is in decommissioned, uh, actually, the, a copper mine in the Upper Peninsula. Uh, both of which have significant environmental issues that outlive the actual economic lives of the facilities. And, and I don't know whether this has anywhere near the order of magnitude environmental issue that would outlive the useful life of the facility or not. It's just something that I wanted to spot as, as something that I'm ignorant about in terms of what those repercussions could be after the useful life of the facility is complete. All right. All right. Thank you very much, uh, all of you professionals. Uh, wonderful information today, and I uh, truly appreciate you taking the time for all of us to uh, ask questions and, and whatnot. We will move on to our public comment. Uh, period. Um, <clears throat> we received several written comments and they will become part of the public record uh, on our website. 
Uh, we have some uh, folks that want to uh, speak today. So uh, just for everyone's understanding, we, uh, we love to hear from folks uh, who want to get up and uh, have their voice heard. It will be limited to two minutes. Uh, Monica uh, will give you a 30 second reminder um, as, as, okay, uh, as you're getting close to the end of your two minutes. Um, we appreciate you uh, giving others time. So when you do hit your 30 seconds, uh, uh, try to uh, bring it to a close for us. Um, and uh, just a reminder that this is a public comment. This is not a Q&A session. We are not uh, here to, uh, we are not going to respond to questions directly. We're happy to try to gather as much information uh, as possible, but uh, this is not a Q&A interaction. This is your opportunity to have your voice heard in public comments. So with that, Monica. Thank you. We'll uh, call you up in the order uh, you signed up today. And the first person is uh, Carol Rawl, if you would like to come up to the microphone. Hi, I'm Carol Rawl. I live in Lansing. Um, this is very interesting. It's a humongous project and um, a lot of technical issues and not, not a one will I address. I um, will leave that to you. <laughs> um, but I do want to thank the members of this uh, authority for the opportunity to speak about uh, Line 5 fossil fuel pipeline and the proposed tunnel. Uh, as a public authority, you represent the public's interests. And I hope that you do your due diligence regarding this folly of a proposed tunnel. I view shutting down Line 5 as an urgent matter and Michigan's greatest environmental threat. The Line 5 fossil fuel pipeline was built 65 years ago. It's highly unlikely that allowing a dangerous oil pipeline to run through our public waters would be sanctioned today. We have evolved enough, I hope, to ask the important questions about how this project impacts climate change. Uh, I mean, well thought of everything, but I'd never heard the word climate, how it affects the environment. We need to see proposals like this in light of our climate and environmental crisis. In 2018, I attended a forum on Line 5 in Traverse City. Several stakeholders were represented, including Enbridge, the Coast Guard, and emergency preparedness uh, personnel. It was terrifying how disastrous an oil leak would be to the Great Lakes. The Coast Guard explained how complicated recovery would be in such complex currents and unpredictable waters, and perhaps impossible in the winter. We don't need this risk to our recreation, fishing, and Michigan's economy. We don't need Line 5, and a tunnel is not going to save us. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Pat Aaron. Okay, thank you. Uh, Bob Vance. I really appreciate it. I learned a lot today. So thank you for uh, coming. As usual, Enbridge has a real good, you know, forward, you know, construction plan that's presented very well. I'm not so sure that their execution has been as um, accurate and good for the communities involved in the environment. Um, beside, there's no guarantee that the re repeatedly shortened length of time proposed to construct the tunnel can be accomplished. There, can, there hasn't been any guarantee that a five-year construction timeline is realistic. And what happens when that timeline proves not to be um, tenable? Who of all of Enbridge's contracted players and subsidiaries will be held accountable? What will the process of accountability be? And will the construction continue? And if it is not possible to continue because of unforeseen aspects of such a plan or a disaster, who will be held accountable? Will the state's taxpayers be expected to coordinate or pay for all or part of such an outcome? 
As if the spill in the Kalamazoo River isn't enough evidence, one might look at what has happened in North Dakota to get an idea about the civic conduct of international oil and gas companies like Enbridge. Virtually abandoned by international companies in Enbridge and its subsidiaries, state and local municipalities in North Dakota are now contending with the end of short-lived jobs, plummeting populations, vacant strip malls, hotels, and scads of temporary and permanent housing no longer necessary in and around little historically impoverished North Dakota towns. One can see fracking pads in various states of use and disuse up to the entrances as well as from viewpoints inside the otherwise spectacular Theodore Roosevelt National Park. Um, one would have to be ignorant of climate change related disasters happening as we speak directly related to fossil fuel use to believe the tunnel and the pipeline are wise uses of our technological initiative. And there's so much of it here. I mean, Enbridge has tons of initiative and, and good planning involved in this. They could apply it to something else. It is hard for me to imagine how we can still be considering it. When will we stop? Or perhaps the question is, when will it stop us? Thank you. Uh, Sean is next. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Sean McBrady, the campaign coordinator for Oil and Water Don't Mix, representing more than 77,000 Michigan residents uh, who are concerned about the prospects of a Line 5 oil spill and the flawed plan to build a tunnel through the Straits of Mackinac. Uh, our request today um, is that the board members initiate an investigation into communications and actions undertaken by the chair of the Straits Corridor Authority, beginning with the authority's initial meeting in December of 2018. The request is prompted by the following, which has raised some serious public concerns and questions. First, under whose authority did Chair Nystrom seek to turn over to Enbridge the opportunity to fund the Mackinac Straits Corridor Authority? In documents obtained by Oil and Water Don't Mix under the Freedom of Information Act, Chair Nystrom is revealed to have repeatedly pushed Enbridge to take over funding of the authority's expert consultants. The consultants were hired to assist the authority in providing oversight of Enbridge's proposed tunnel. The nearly 500,000 in authorizing consultant contracts has already come under scrutiny after being signed by Nystrom during an 11 month period where there were no public meetings held by the authority. Does the chair as a member of the corridor authority, number two, present a conflict of interest uh, for Chair Nystrom? Chair Nystrom, the executive vice president of the Michigan Infrastructure and Transportation Association, which represents union and non-union contractors, including JD contractors, who Enbridge has hired for the tunnel project. JD's founder, John DePonio, is a member of the MIDA Board of Directors. As part of its oversight responsibilities, the Corridor Authority reviews and approves Enbridge's construction, design, and implementation plans. Number three, does the Corridor Authority agree that the public should not have access to the draft RFP for construction of the proposed tunnel, and was Chair Nystrom consulted on a decision to deny access? The draft request for construction proposals is under review by the authority, which is a public body, but in response to a FOIA request from Oil and Water Don't Mix's communication coordinator, David Holtz, MDOT declined to provide a copy of the draft construction proposal, saying that only Enbridge can access it via private online portal. Among other details, the RFP would likely set parameters and qualifications for bidders on a $1 to $2 billion project. The Infrastructure Association represents 500 construction contractors, and as one of the three authority members, Nystrom is in a position to influence and eventually approve any draft RFP. So we request that the board uh, looks into these uh, potential conflicts um, moving forward and lets the public know. Thank you. Uh, Leslie Watson. My name is Leslie Watson and I live in the Grand Ledge area. And I'm interested in um, the documentation, the transparency of all that has taken place uh, with the agreements and also the records of the operations. Uh, the incident at the Kalamazoo River caught my attention, has continued to be a matter of interest to me because of the long-term effects that it has upon uh, people. Uh, their ability to have clean water to drink 
and to have uh, recreation available to be able to eat the fish. Uh, it affects many different aspects of, of uh, business, whether it's tourist or fishing industry, whatever. And so the fact that Enbridge had an operational system in place with the uh, pipeline break at the Kalamazoo River and it took so many hours and it caused so much damage as a result. And two days ago, I spoke to uh, a woman named Deborah Hamilton and she can no longer have recreation in the river. Uh, she has pictures that there are still uh, particles of oil coming to the surface, even after over, a, what, a billion dollars worth of cleanup cost. Uh, and so you can't eat the fish there. What a disaster this would be for the Straits area and all the communities that would be affected. And so I want to know that documentation is kept and that it is available according to the law through the uh, Freedom of Information Act. So thank you. Uh, Maya is next. Um, hi there, my name is Maya Ernoff. Uh, I'm from Mason and I'm 23 years old. I'm a master's student in public policy. Um, and I know I don't have you know, the decades of experience that you gentlemen have, um, but I hope that you will take my comments and you know, combine them with that experience to ask those important questions because unfortunately for folks in my generation, by the time we accrue that experience to sometimes be taken seriously in a space like this, you know, it will be too late. Um, the pipeline will be built and much worse will have happened. So um, the couple concerns I wanted to highlight about this proposed plan are first, the possibility of leaks and their economic and health impacts. Second, other negative health and economic impacts on the communities. And third, overall impacts with regards to climate change. So first, um, we know that this pipeline is going to leak, either during construction or after. And we know this because of Enbridge's track record. I mean, this is a company that's notorious for cutting corners on safety to put profit over human lives. And um, the woman who was talking and presenting earlier, I'm sorry, I don't, I don't remember her name, was mentioning the cumulative 50 years of experience with Enbridge that some of these folks have on the project. And as a citizen, that's very concerning to me because in the last 50 years, Enbridge has leaked 1.1 million gallons of oil into the Great Leaks, including the Kalamazoo River spill. So what is the experience that we're talking about here, experience poisoning our water? Um, and in addition to that fact, we only need to look at the more recent project of Line 3 and how Enbridge is handling that. So we know for a fact that these pipelines are gonna leak after they're constructed, right? Which is gonna decimate the fishing industry, the tourism industry, our drinking water. And their basic argument is, well, if we don't build a pipeline, it'll raise the price of gas. But if we do build a pipeline, it's going to raise the price of water, which is a resource that everyone's going to need for the next 100 years and beyond. But then what about the leakages during construction? And we see that with Enbridge's Line 3 right now. There were dozens of frack outs and drill spills during the construction of that water, which had to be, as usual with Enbridge, reported by the public. I'm sorry, ma'am, I know it's not your fault, but I'm actually gonna take longer than two minutes because they did have four hours. And so this is really important, so I'm gonna maybe take three minutes and everyone, you know, we can stay another minute and I'm sorry, I know it's not your fault. Um, so in, in that case, they had repeated frack outs in oil um, and drill fluid leakages during construction that poison the water, you can't fish the water, you can't drink the water, and we're protecting 20% of the world's remaining fresh water. One of the only remaining reliable sources of fresh water in the world is the Great Lakes. And some, for example, they're talking about the, f the slurry and the drill fluid. Well, benzene, when it reacts with water and can cling to other substances, can be an irremovable toxic chemical. So if there's even one leak, there goes the fishing industry, the tourism industry, our drinking water costs. And that's not to mention the other disparate impacts during construction that don't have to do with a leak itself. I actually had the opportunity to go to the Line 3 construction sites 
and it is an unholy, ungodly noise 24 hours a day. What is that going to do to our tourism industries? They said that they would bring in all Minnesota workers there, but it was actually majority workers from out of state. And what happens when you take thousands of men from out of state and put them in small towns with nothing to do but spend money, what happens? Enbridge workers were busted to do with three sex trafficking rings, primarily but not exclusively targeting indigenous women. And that's something that all of the tribes of Michigan have warned the state of Michigan about with regards to this company. And I think that given the name of, of the Mackinac Straits Authority, that we need to not just use indigenous names and use indigenous water and use indigenous land, but listen to their voices. So those are some disparate impacts just to do with the construction itself. And then finally, we have the climate impacts. Now, first of all, the incentives are not in line for Enbridge to prioritize safety and our climate on any level, because any fines that they'll pay for a leakage or a spillage are nothing compared to the billions of dollars that we're guaranteeing them with a 99-year contract. And we know this because they've continued to operate the current pipeline, even though it's too old to operate and it's actually very dangerous for them to do. And that's not even counting for the billions of dollars in greenhouse gas emissions that will result from the continued use of fossil fuels. Now, as the gentleman before mentioned, and this is my last point, I'm so sorry. The gentleman before mentioned, Enbridge has the money to invest their innovation and technology into renewable solutions like solar, like wind, like innovative solutions for the UP. But instead, they keep investing in fossil fuels. Based on the IPCC reports, the UN, we all know the science, right? We don't have time to build new fossil fuel infrastructure. We need to transition now. And we know that in order to stay under 1.5 degrees Celsius increase, we can invest in new fossil fuel infrastructure. And if we do, millions and billions of people will be displaced and murdered. And I'm using the word murdered very intentionally because we all know the science at this point. The Enbridge executives, they know the science at this point, and they're continuing to invest and make billions of dollars off of fossil fuels that are killing everyone else. And so I'm really begging you as, as the authority with all of the engineering expertise that I don't have, um, please do your due diligence with this project. Ask those tough questions and ask, do we really need a new pipeline or are there alternatives for Michigan? Are there other ways we can get jobs, other ways we can get energy that we can invest in instead? It's not a choice between keeping an old pipeline that's going to leak and building a new one that's going to leak. We have other options and I really beg you to encourage um, with whatever authority you have uh, us to take them and thank you for letting me go over. Sorry for this. Uh, next, we have David. Yeah, thank you. Um, my name is Dave Holtz, and uh, I'm with Oil and Water Don't Mix as a communications coordinator. And um, there were just a three three quick things that I wanted to raise. Um, one was to reinforce what Sean had shared with you on this RFP. Uh, for the construction proposal that in the FOIA documents that I received, members, um, it suggested to me that uh, the only people that didn't have access to the RFP were people who Enbridge decided couldn't have access, but that you all had access to it, and, or at least MDOT sta staff had access to it. This is too important a document not to be under public scrutiny uh, when you make that decision. So encourage you to move forward with getting public access to that important document. And then quickly, um, when Arup gave its presentation, there's they had a 3,000-page GDR, um, yet there were no findings or recommendations on whether the, the tunnel should be built in this specific geo formation that the tunnel's being proposed to build in. Uh, that's another question that seem to come out from today. Uh, the other uh, question was the porosity test um, and, and the, 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 f the fact that the borings that were done, the geophysical borings were done, were less than one-tenth of the recommended geo, geo uh, technical borings that should be done. Uh, this seems like uh, a very uh, a strong recipe for a potential calamity if this tunnel is ever constructed. Thank you. Uh, and the last individual who uh, asked to speak today is uh, Terry Wilker Wilkerson.
Hi, thank you for listening to us. I'm one person, a Michigan real estate broker for over three decades who loves our Great Lakes and who got up early to drive here an hour and, and listen to the presentation and ask questions. I came to ask you three people to ask lots more questions and be skeptical about what you hear because there is so much at stake here. I have serious questions and concerns about this project that's 23 football fields long. And here are a few of the questions I hope that you'll be asking. Enbridge's slide shows only one actual boring within 60% of the length of the deepest route. That means a lot of assumptions have been made about this project. 12 football fields worth of length with only one actual boring in that amount of space? That, that just seems like way too little. And what about the storage and disposal of the material withdrawn? Some pollution was mentioned. Uh, what about radon being released from that? We know that it's in limestone and there were problems in Mackinac Island with, ri with radon being released from limestone. And what about the likelihood of destroying an archeological site which has yet to be explored that seems to span about 5,000 feet on either side of the, of the current line fives? I was involved with that exploration and I tried to submit comments online but was unable to, so perhaps I can do that as after this. But um, we don't even know what's there yet and I'm very concerned that the pollutants will, will bury it or destroy it. And there's also a NOAA-conducted multi-beam survey that was done in the area on both sides of Line 5, which I hope that you will look up and consider as part of your independent information. And then the biggest oversight, what about the jarring vibration and the motion of all this construction right below the existing, frail, 68-year-old Line 5 that's anchor-dented, that's improperly supported, that has had many structural supports already replaced. I'm just, I haven't heard one single word about that, and that's extremely concerning because I believe we have a ticking time bomb there. And the Coast Guard has said that the best case cleanup, best case of an oil spill, any oil spill, is 30%. And that assumes daylight, no ice, waves of less than three feet, and that all the equipment is on site. So that means that even uh, with a small spill, we're looking at, at decimating Mackinac Island in three counties. That's a small spill. We have up, up to 720 uh, feet of shoreline that are vulnerable. I'm almost done. Enbridge was just fined $3.3 million this past week in Minnesota. This is relevant to Line 5 because it shows yet another example of Enbridge's disregard of the law and lack of responsibility. Enbridge's actions are clear violation of Minnesota state law and of public trust. And we know that in Michigan too because they're illegally operating right now since the easement has been revoked and they have just thumbed their nose at that and continue to operate. Um, there's just so many violations. And lastly, Enbridge is already responsible for the two largest inland oil spills in the United States, the two. We talk about Kalamazoo quite a bit but Enbridge was also responsible for an even larger spill in Minnesota back in the 90s. And yet we keep entrusting them, and I just hope that you will ask a lot more questions. Thank you very much. All right, that concludes the public comment. Okay, are there any other questions, comments, authority members? Either one of you? If I can make a few observations, um, primarily because this is my first meeting and and it's my first opportunity to really raise them publicly. Um, the first is I wanted to thank uh, both of you for enabling us to have uh, this kind of working session, even though there were no agenda items that required us to uh, conduct a, a vote or take an action, I think it's valuable having these types of sessions so that as much information and, and interaction um, as, as can be done is done and, and conducted in a public way. I'd, I would like to have the opportunity at some point in the future to have a session similar to this where we give a broadened opportunity for some of the public advocacy groups 
that uh, have shown clear interest in this project or disinterest maybe um, uh, have a similar opportunity to provide um, more expanded uh, presentations in something other than a two or three minute per person um, public comment process at the end because I know how frustrating from past experience it can be sometimes to to present in that way um, there are a couple other questions that I have that I just want to flag for purposes of future ongoing discussion one is that in reviewing one of the recent Michigan Public Service Commission uh, opinions or remand proceedings uh, involving uh, Enbridge's application to the PSC, there is considerable discussion of the application of MEPA uh, to their review of the application that is pending at the PSC. And for example, some of the climate change questions in greenhouse gas questions uh, with respect to the ongoing operation of a of a petroleum infrastructure um, I think is contemplated to be evaluated in that process but one of the things that I'd like us to it, uh, at least get some handle on and maybe you two already have this handle but I don't is the interaction of MEPA and its application or potential application to the decisions that we're making. Um, the PSC decision makes reference to the Bugs Michigan Court of Appeals case, which I have not reviewed, but um, if you can shoot Ray a copy of it to me, um, I'd, I'd appreciate it to give us maybe a little better understanding as to the potential application of MEPA to this process. The other factor that's referenced in the MPSC uh, opinion that I similarly would like to get a, uh, a better handle on is um, the role of tribal consultation um, in any of the determinations that we make uh, and what our obligations and requirements are in terms of enabling uh, either the Bay Mills or uh, or other tribal authorities to participate in this process um, one other and, and these are just kind of random thoughts that I have it's it's this has just become my first opportunity to really voice them um, and and by the way one of the things that is frustrating about a three-member board is my view of the Open Meetings Act is I can't really talk to either of these guys without violating the Open Meetings Act. So I'm, I'm saying all this stuff now because it's been my first opportunity to talk to these two guys. Um, and and uh, so uh, I, I just, that, that's the reason why I'm kind of going through this laundry list. Um, Freedom of Information Act, a couple of speakers have identified that is an issue. Um, in my view, and it's, it's been a while since I've looked at the case law on this, there are instances when information can be provided by Enbridge to the authority under a promise of confidentiality. There are exemptions under FOIA that enable that. Um, I don't know whether statutorily Enbridge would meet those exemptions for purposes of the decisions that we as an authority would make. And if they don't meet those exemptions, then I don't think information should be conveyed to us in a manner that uh, that that would remain confidential. Um, so, 
in my view, there are two options. One is to have them convey information to us that then becomes subject to the Freedom of Information Act and available to the public if they are to request it. The other is to convey information to us in a manner that complies with confidentiality exceptions under FOIA. Um, but I don't think that there is a third option of conveying information to us uh, in a manner that doesn't fit within one of those first two options. Um, the, there, there have been some comments today also regarding the adequacy of the hydrogeological borings that have taken place. I think the statistic that was referenced was that a tenth of the borings that should have been performed were. I, I don't know what the basis for that statement was, but if we could have a submission uh, from Enbridge that replies to that particular comment, it, it would be useful, at least to me, to have an understanding as to the adequacy of the borings that have been performed. I understand from the presentation, and this was early this morning, that in addition to borings, one of the other methods of uh, determining the contours of the substrata was the use of seismic imaging and, and there are, I assume, techniques in addition to boring that informed the company in arriving at the conclusions they've arrived at about the components of the substrata. Um, I, I just don't have a sufficient feel or a sufficient comfort level on that to, to feel com comfortable with it. Um, those are kind of just the random um, observations that I have uh, to share with folks at the first meeting other than, you know, my introductory ones about college football, which which, by the way, I don't view as a violation of the Open Meetings Act if I make those types of observations to my colleagues, <laughs> even if they're done in, outside of a public session. <laughs> That's all I have. I just want to thank the people that went to the effort to put this together. Uh, frankly, over the few meetings that the, that the authority has had, I've almost felt like uh, because we couldn't communicate with each other, that we were all carrying, uh, likely carrying a different image of what was really going on. And uh, so I, I really valued this meeting. Now other, I don't think we're done. I think there's some things we have to understand, but I, really believe that uh, our responsibility is not to be blindsided by some sort of a, uh, event that uh, we could have explored before it ha happened. Uh, that description that, uh, uh, sorry, my age, I forget names, uh, of risk assessment I thought was very good, that it's forward looking, it's not backward looking. And they, uh, uh, we've got to participate that as a public representatives. So anyway, I just wanted to appreciate, express my appreciation for this, uh, this uh, session. <clears throat> well, I felt it was an excellent presentation today. Excellent comments, Paul, I'm glad that you were able to bring in some new thoughts and ideas. And um, I believe that uh, Ray, Ryan, we are planning on uh, having a few of those points that Paul brought up uh, discussed at our October meeting. The tribal consultation uh, is, is on the agenda. Um, and uh, we will continue to, uh, we will look forward to a presentation from Mike Mooney on the RFP. 
um, as our tunnel consultant. Um, and so we'll look forward to some good discussion then. And with that, we'll call this meeting to a close. Thank you. <laughs>